So today we'll be returning to the Raspberry Pi and we'll be going over more details on its GPIO header. This video will be more of a general overview of the various peripherals and communication protocols that are available not only on the Raspberry Pi, but other SBCs and microcontrollers as well. Then in my next video, I'll be doing several hands-on examples implementing some of the protocols I talk about today. And we'll interface the Raspberry Pi with a few different sensors, including an ultrasonic distance sensor and an IMU. IMUs contain an accelerometer and gyroscope, and are useful for robotics projects and vehicles, and are an essential part of any aircraft. But of course, the IMU I'll be using in the next video isn't nearly as accurate as the one you'd find in an aircraft, but from a software perspective, the principles are still the same. Now this is actually a follow-up video to a previous one where I gave an introduction to GPIO pins and showed how to install a Python library to control a simple LED circuit, but this barely scratched the surface of what we can do with the GPIO pins, so I thought it would be a good idea to give a general overview of some of its more advanced functions before we do some more examples in the next video. But before we begin, I wanted to quickly mention that if you appreciate this sort of content, then be sure to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. This is the easiest way to help the channel grow, so thanks in advance. Now let's jump straight into it and talk about the peripherals and communication protocols that are supported by the Raspberry Pi's GPIO header. Like I've mentioned in a previous video, the Raspberry Pi and SBCs in general are unique because they basically bridge the gap between a desktop or laptop PC and a microcontroller, or MCU for short. Microcontrollers are basically small computers in a single chip which typically don't contain an operating system, but rather they're meant to run a single C program. In many small electronics devices, they serve as the main computer, but they're also commonly found in larger systems where they act as a coprocessor and are controlled by a full-size CPU or a more powerful MCU. But what makes microcontrollers unique is that they contain a number of peripherals and communication protocols which allows them to interface with all kinds of circuits and devices, including motors, sensors, and much more. These are features that aren't available on your typical desktop or laptop. The Raspberry Pi contains many of these same features you'd find on a microcontroller, but pairs that functionality with a powerful ARM CPU which is much faster than anything you'd find in a typical MCU. So again, Raspberry Pis and SBCs combine features from both microcontrollers and regular PCs. Now if we look at the main functions of the GPIO pins, we'll find two 5V pins, two 3.3V pins, several ground pins, and a number of GPIO pins. The 5 volt pins are used to power your 5 volt devices, and the maximum current these pins can provide will entirely depend on the power supply that's connected to your Pi. Generally speaking, most Pis will use around 1 or 2 amps max, so if you're using a 4 amp power supply then you can safely assume you have at least 2 amps available for other devices. But the 3.3 volt pins on the other hand are powered by an onboard regulator and the maximum current depends on the model you're using. The original Pi's can only provide about 50 milliamps, while later models can provide up to 1 amp. But some of the Pi's onboard peripherals are also powered by this regulator, so the exact amount of current available to the user can vary. I've read sources that said they could pull up to 800 milliamps on the 3.3 volt pins, while other sources say to stay below 500 milliamps just to be safe. If you need more current, then you'll need to wire up your own regulator. Now the GPIO pins provide general purpose input and output, which is what GPIO stands for. And these can be set to be digital inputs or digital outputs. These pins are rated for 3.3 volts, so if you set up an output pin to ON, then you'll get 3.3 volts from it. The maximum current they can provide is only about 10 to 15 milliamps. In my previous video on GPIO pins, I showed how to connect one of these to an external transistor circuit to power an LED. 
but I didn't show how to use the input pins, so that's something I'm also planning to cover in my next video. Now if we look at the outer boxes here, we'll see some more advanced functions that can be assigned to these particular pins. Some of these functions are communication protocols used for transferring data with various devices. UART is the most basic form of serial communications. It contains two pins. The TX pin is used for sending data to another device, and the RX pin is used for receiving data. Generally speaking, UART is the slowest form of communications compared to the other protocols I'll be talking about. But it depends on the exact hardware being used, and some devices can support faster UART speeds. Another disadvantage of UART is that it's only designed to accept two devices on a single connection. Now, I2C is another communications protocol and is commonly used to interface with sensors. This one also has two pins, but their functionality is different. The SEL pin is the clock, and this allows each device to share the same clock signal. This means devices can synchronize with each other, which allows for faster transmission speeds with less overhead, when compared to UART. The other pin is called the SDA pin, and this is used for the actual data. Unlike UART, this single data pin can be used for both transmitting and receiving data. Another advantage of I2C is that you can connect a large number of devices to a single bus. For example, you could have a single microcontroller act as the master, which means it coordinates all the communications, and then you can add dozens of different sensors and other peripherals all connected to this single bus. This is possible because each device has its own unique address. Now SPY is another protocol supported by the Pi with these 5 pins here, but only 4 pins are required. SPY has a clock and separate transmit and receive lines, which allows for synchronous communications. The CS pin tells the peripheral that it should wake up and receive or send data, and is also used when multiple peripherals are present to select the one you'd like to talk to. SPY can achieve much faster speeds than I2C can, so it's used in situations where I2C isn't fast enough. I2C and SPY are used for all sorts of communications inside a wide range of systems. Let's take a regular PC motherboard as an example which contains a number of chipsets and microcontrollers. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what's referred to as the Southbridge chipset, which manages various components such as storage devices and additional PCI Express lanes. The Southbridge typically connects to the CPU through a PCI Express bus. For example, if we look at an AMD X570 chipset, the Southbridge connects to the CPU with a PCI Express 4.0 X4 bus. But on a typical motherboard, you'll find several smaller chipsets and microcontrollers in addition to the Southbridge. But these don't connect to the CPU through a PCI Express bus because they don't need that much bandwidth. So these additional microcontrollers typically use I2C or SPY to communicate with the CPU. But even though I2C and SPY are used internally in a typical PC motherboard, these buses aren't meant to be controlled by the user, and trying to access them for your own purposes would be extremely difficult, even for advanced users. So like I said, having these protocols available on the Raspberry Pi is extremely useful, and we'll be definitely using these in future projects. Now PWM is another function that's supported on the Pi's GPIO header, on these pins here. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation, and is typically used for controlling the speed of motors and brightness of LEDs, and a few other similar applications. It works by creating a square wave at a specific frequency and duty cycle. I've talked a bit about PWM before in my Electronics 101 videos, and I plan to cover it more in depth in future videos. Now the last notable function available on the GPIO header is PCM, which is used to transmit digital audio. This can be connected to a device called a DAC, which stands for Digital to Analog Converter. 
Unlike digital output pins which can only be set to on or off, DAX can be set to a number of different output voltages. For example, an 8-bit DAC can be set to 256 different output voltages. This allows a DAC to create a wide range of complex signals, including audio signals. Most Raspberry Pis contain a DAC in the form of a headphone jack. Now, similar to a DAC, there's also a device called an ADC, which stands for Analog to Digital Converter. Unlike digital input pins which can only detect on or off, an ADC allows you to read varying voltages. It's similar to a DAC, but instead of being used for output, it's used for input. For example, it can be used to read an audio signal and convert it to digital data. But for some reason the Raspberry Pi doesn't contain an ADC, even though this is a feature commonly found in most microcontrollers. For example, the Raspberry Pi Pico contains an ADC, although not a very good one. And even this tiny PIC-12 microcontroller which only costs 76 cents contains an ADC, and not a bad one either. But for some reason they didn't include one on the Raspberry Pi. In situations where we need an ADC, we'll need to connect a microcontroller to our Raspberry Pi, which can communicate with each other through UART, I2C, or SPI. In future videos, I'll also be showing how to use these microcontrollers which will not only give us access to an ADC, but some other useful peripherals as well, which aren't available on the Pi. For example, if we look at the datasheet for this PIC microcontroller, we'll find UART, I2C, SPI, and PWM, but we'll also find additional peripherals not found on the Pi including ADCs, timers, capture inputs, comparators, and more. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of the various peripherals that are available on the Raspberry Pi's GPIO header and other SBCs and microcontrollers. Of course, this was just a general introduction and I'll be getting into more details on these in future videos. If you have any questions, feel free to drop a comment and be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.